When we think about which English ruler could be considered a good king, Henry VIII is rarely among the names that come to mind. His reign descended into tyranny, sparing neither joy, family, wives, nor even his own people. The question of whether he might, in fact, have been the worst of all English monarchs seems more plausible. Historians often respond to such assertions with a familiar reaction, an audible sigh, followed by the explanation that the issue is more complex than it appears. What does it truly mean for a king to be good or bad? For example, Henry VIII was undoubtedly skilled at jousting, making him an excellent king in that regard. Conversely, his indulgent eating habits made him a poor example of personal discipline. However, neither of these traits directly relates to his role as monarch. This brings us to the question of what criteria determine whether a king is good or bad in their capacity as ruler. I'll aim to keep this section concise, but it's worth noting that there are extensive discussions about ruler virtues and the philosophy of kingship. In fact, these topics could fill hours of video content. For the sake of focus, I'll simplify these explanations with apologies to viewers already well-versed in this area. My goal is to avoid detracting from the primary focus of this video. Ideas about what defines a good ruler have existed as long as rulers themselves. From ancient Greece and the Roman Empire, we have inherited numerous writings on the subject. One of the most famous quotes comes from the Roman playwright Titus Maccius Plautus in the 3rd century BC, Homo homini lupus, or a man is the man's wolf. However, this quote does not end there. It continues, non homo quam qualis sit non novit, meaning not a human being as long as he does not know what kind the other is. In the 17th century, the philosopher and mathematician Thomas Hobbes took up the first part of this quote to argue for the necessity of a state monopoly on the use of force. Writing against the backdrop of the English Civil War, Hobbes suggested that a superior power was essential to prevent people from harming one another. He proposed that, through an unspoken social contract, the ruled agreed to this arrangement in exchange for their own protection. Hobbes, a royalist, championed an absolutist form of governance, arguing that such concentrated power enabled rulers to fulfill their primary function, taming humanity's destructive impulses and safeguarding society. For the first time, he articulated in a systematic way ideas that English kings had long adhered to the notion that power was necessary for a monarch to effectively govern and protect their subjects. A good king, therefore, was understood to be a strong monarch who was unafraid to wield his power. The cautionary example was Henry VI, whose weakness was widely blamed for the Wars of the Roses. Yet this power had to be exercised for the common good. A king's duties included administering justice, defending the realm in war, ensuring the provision of essential resources and creating laws to protect his people. By late antiquity, the defense of the Christian faith was also considered a key part of these responsibilities, further justifying the exercise of power. However, it was considered undesirable for a ruler to wield power arbitrarily or solely for personal gain. Since ancient times, kings were guided by the four cardinal virtues understanding, justice, piety, and bravery. Over time, other virtues, such as the display of grace, were added. For instance, the Roman Emperor Augustus minted coins bearing the words salus and moderatio, meaning well-being and restraint, to symbolize his vision of ideal governance. The dynastic imperative was also central to the concept of kingship, particularly in the Middle Ages. As kings were seen as divinely appointed, securing an heir to the throne was paramount. A stable succession not only preserved the divinely sanctioned bloodline, but also minimized the risk of civil war. Thus, 
the dynastic question remained critical, even without the religious justification. The gravest offence a ruler could commit was injustice. Closely tied to this was the concept of honour, which was of central importance in medieval society. A king's personal honour demanded that he govern in a manner morally aligned with Christian values. A just ruler was considered honourable, while injustice was seen as proof of dishonour. Notably, some aspects of a king's life were not directly tied to his role as ruler, such as his treatment of family. While kings were expected to lead Christian lives, familial matters were often considered private. This distinction meant that a monarch could behave poorly in his personal life, yet still fulfil the responsibilities of a good king. Henry VIII, for instance, was a deeply flawed individual in private matters, but in certain aspects of governance, he demonstrated the traits of an effective ruler. Henry VIII adhered to many of the traditional virtues and responsibilities of kingship, albeit in a manner unique to his character and reign. He dedicated immense energy to securing the continuation of his dynasty, ultimately succeeding. The Tudors remained on the throne until 1603. The transfer of power in 1547, following his death, was remarkably smooth given the religious upheavals of the preceding years, even as the crown passed to his young son, Edward VI. Henry saw himself as a defender of Christianity, a self-image he maintained despite profound conflicts with the papacy, the dissolution of monasteries, and the persecution of Catholics. While these actions were viewed differently by his contemporaries, particularly those who suffered under them, Henry steadfastly believed in his role as protector of the Christian faith. In his mind, this responsibility became even more vital when he declared himself head of the Church of England. This belief drove him to extremes, including tragedies like the execution of Anne Askew, acts that modern perspectives find impossible to condone. However, Henry perceived such measures as necessary to safeguard his vision of Christianity. Undoubtedly, Henry was a strong king, arguably one of the strongest in English history, and he did not hesitate to wield his power. His brutal suppression of uprisings, such as the Pilgrimage of Grace, exemplifies this. For a populace that still remembered the chaos of the Wars of the Roses, Henry's decisive, albeit ruthless, actions fulfilled the expectations of the time. While he lacked the moderatio, restraint, that Augustus idealized, his approach resonated with contemporary standards of kingship. Militarily, Henry met the minimum expectations of his era. He ensured that England avoided invasion, though his campaigns against France achieved mixed results. The wars drained the treasury and fell short of his ambitions. But Henry avoided catastrophic defeats like those of Henry VI or Queen Mary, under whom England lost Calais. Diplomatically, he was pragmatic, forming alliances as necessary even with nations or factions he personally disliked. Henry officially respected the authority of the courts and parliament, though cases involving his personal interests invariably ended in his favour, illustrating the limits of judicial independence during his reign. However, contrary to popular belief, Henry's interference in the judiciary for matters unrelated to himself was less frequent than often assumed. In governance, Henry entrusted significant responsibilities to capable individuals, rather than favouring those of noble rank. Figures like Thomas Cromwell and Thomas Wolsey exemplify his preference for ability over status. While this approach facilitated large-scale reforms and projects, it also fostered corruption as ambitious social climbers exploited their positions. Nevertheless, this meritocratic tendency enabled Henry to achieve monumental changes. In his final 15 years, Henry presided over a government that severed ties with Rome instituted independent religious reforms, dissolved monasteries, launched extensive construction projects, established the Royal Navy, 
founded institutions like Trinity College, strengthened Parliament, and waged war against France. These reforms triggered sweeping societal transformations within a short time frame. That the government managed these upheavals effectively owed much to Henry's reliance on competent advisers, even if he sometimes regretted their fate, most famously in the case of Cromwell, whose 1540 execution Henry reportedly lamented shortly afterward. Henry VIII sought to embody the four cardinal virtues of kingship, wisdom, justice, piety, and bravery. He received a superb education, engaged with scholarly thought, authored books, and surrounded himself with intellectuals whose counsel he valued, though he did not always follow it. He regarded himself as a devout and just ruler, unafraid of war or adversity. While his reign was marked by excesses and contradictions, Henry's accomplishments and determination to fulfill his role left an indelible mark on England's history. I can completely understand if, at this point, you, as a viewer, feel that my remarks make it sound like Henry VIII would have approved of my words, while simultaneously thinking they bear little resemblance to reality. It may also seem misguided to devote so much praise to him. Personally, I see Henry VIII as a narcissistic monster who inflicted immense terror upon his people. This apparent contradiction requires explanation. How can I praise Henry VIII while also condemning him as a tyrannical monster? Let me address the obvious first. Much of the praise I've given does not apply to his entire reign. In his later years, Henry descended fully into despotism, ruling with unchecked cruelty and caprice. The distinction lies in separating Henry as a private individual from Henry as a king. As monarch, he wielded power that allowed him to shape his personal relationships in ways that often had catastrophic consequences due to his deeply flawed character. The purpose of this discussion is to demonstrate what historians mean when they assert that we must evaluate historical figures within the context of their own time. During Henry's reign, the English people judged him primarily on how well he fulfilled the role of a good king by their standards. His private relationships were not entirely irrelevant, but they mattered less to his subjects than his treatment of them as a ruler. This perspective was partly shaped by the limited information available to his contemporaries. For example, consider the execution of Catherine Howard. What most people knew was that she had allegedly concealed past sexual relationships. This revelation was explosive because of the risk that the queen might bear a child fathered by someone other than the king, creating a potential heir to the throne who was not of royal blood. However, the people could not accurately assess how realistic this danger was. In contrast, we, with the benefit of extensive historical records, can afford the luxury of judging Henry by the moral standards of our time. From this vantage point, the verdict is unambiguous. Henry VIII was a cruel, monstrous man and a tyrannical king. Yet to be fair, his actions must also be measured against the expectations of his own era, and by those standards, he fulfilled many of the roles expected of a strong monarch. This distinction is often overlooked when evaluating controversial historical figures, not just Henry VIII, but others like Mary I or Richard III. To understand them fully, we must refrain from imposing our modern values upon them, and instead, judge them within the context of their own time. I hope you'll forgive the clickbait title, which I chose in the hope of making a video about historical methodology more engaging. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this discussion, please like and subscribe to help my channel grow.